Now, on hell, are you ready? I think so. Let's go. Now, welcome on hell. So, hello everyone. Yay! You know, I, I, I can like build this fame of being like the energetic, funny, energizing guy. And that means I always get like the crappiest slot in the conference at the last time, the last hour, the second day. Everyone's tired, everyone's like, good, when are we going home? Now is the time for the crazy funnier. Yay, that's me. So, welcome to this uh, second to last session of the day. I'm going to be uh, very, very tight on, on schedule. I have 30 minutes, and I've been asked to talk about the Exciting topic of performance reviews! Yay! Let's make fun of that! That's difficult. <laughs> so anyway, uh, oops. Anyway, small introduction. My name is Ángel, I'm from Venezuela. I come from Spain. These slides will be available later on because I want you to pro I want to provide you in this talk with a lot of materials that you can use later on in your companies in order to ignite the argument, the discussion, the conversation around performance of price as performance review, reviews. It's not like I'm going to solve your problem for you in 30 minutes, it's not that easy, but I guess I can give you a lot of materials so you can get the conversation started. So you will have a lot of information in these slides that are going, that are going to be publicly available after the talk. I will put them on the slide share. You will have my contact information here. Um, and basically, if anyone is also curious about the drawings or anything, I'm available to clarify or to point you to resources so you can learn to do the same stuff. Anyway, as I mentioned, I have 30 minutes and I want to make uh, my conversation my point as quick as possible. So my thesis is that performance reviews are deeply broken, they are evil. First of all, I'm going to use Seth Godin's principle of broken things, which says, if I say that something is broken, it's broken, <laughs> okay? For me, it's enough. I see them as it's broken, so probably they are broken. But they are, I have more reasons to say that performance reviews are not also only broken, they are evil. One reason is uh, they tend to humiliate people, they tend to punish people, they disencourage people. Nobody I know is afraid to have, dude, it's been like, dude, next week we have performance reviews. Are you excited? It's like, oh, the best time of the year. It's Christmas, Halloween, and performance reviews. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Nobody in the world is like, oh my god, we hate them. Okay? Both managers and employees, I'm going to make that point later on. And also, second th reason where, which I think it's, uh, the second reason I can think of when I think that performance reviews are evil is that they are highly arbitrary, they are highly random, they are very subjective. There's one person that decides you have been good, you have been bad, you have reached your goals. Oh, no, no, but we have to make that subjective. Well, in this case, subjective is very objective. This is very, very difficult to make it subjective. Also, they trigger zero-sum games. You know, zero-sum games is when you have that limited amount of resources, like money, and then you say, okay, every single dollar that Olaf makes, you are not going to make it because there's a limited amount. So if I give Olaf 50% of the bonuses, then there's only 50% of the bonuses left for the rest of you. So people start to fight over a limited resource. And that's again all our actual principles of collaboration and trust and openness. It breaks it, okay? Um, they cost a lot, and at the end of the day, I'm not sure they are valid ways of achieving their purpose, which is, I don't know, motivate people, drive performance, make people more productive. I don't think that the performance advisors are doing that. Fact, we hate them. You see resources, you see research, and you see that there are only two things that we hate more than performance appraisals, which is yearly budgets. We hate that. I'm firing people. We hate, hate that. That's really, really unpleasant. And then the next thing we hate, both managers and employees, is the performance appraisals, the performance review level. And you say, okay, but maybe even though everyone in the world hates them, they are a good thing. And you're like, really? Are we all wrong? Everyone in the planet? You know, your brain is a very complex analyzing thing. And sometimes you are like, mm, I don't trust this person. And you don't know why. You don't trust him. There's something. Sometimes there's like hidden information. There are small bits that your brain is speaking and it's creating an unconscious conclusion, which is, I don't trust this person. 
And, and when everyone in the world is like, I can trust this process, or I don't like this process, probably we should think, maybe we are all right. Maybe we are not, there is not, there's not a situation where everyone in the planet is wrong. It makes no sense. Another fact, we are getting rid of them. Not only fancy companies like Zappos or Netflix or Google or Facebook, also traditional companies like Deloitte and SAP and Accenture and General Electric. And I'm sorry if there's someone from Accenture in the company, you're not a fashionable company. Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, these are not fashion companies, but still they're getting rid of the performance prices process. Like for instance, SAP, here you have a quote. The annual review was credited. Managers have anxiety about communicating annual writing decisions. The company fears it spent two and a half hours of management time prepping for each review, 200,000 hours a year, for conversations that were very past focused and layered with the anxiety associated with the rating. We have another quote from Accenture, from the CEO himself. We are done with the famous annual performance review, where once a year I'm going to share with you what I think about you. That doesn't make any sense. We're getting rid of all this comparison with other people. Then we have another quote from Deloitte. Deloitte known, long knew that their all performance management approach neither boosted employee engagement nor high performance. Deloitte conducted a public survey to find out what managers thought of performance reviews. And 58% of managers stated that traditional performance reviews did not serve its, its, its purpose. It was discovered that the whole performance review cycle, filling forms, holding meetings, and doing the actual ratings, consumed around 2 million hours a year. I'm going to read that again. 2 million hours a year. Most of this time was apparently spent discussing ratings instead of actually talking to employees about performance. What the fuck? <laughs> this hurts. So, you have another comment that I found in the LinkedIn thread, and I thought it was very, very interesting. There was this guy, Gordon Newman, and he said, my findings were that bad managers needed a strict formal review process in order to consider important performance aspects and discuss them with the staff. But this did not improve their managing or motivational skills. It was a big band-aid. Worse yet, great managers we're wasting time filling out review forms to document what was already clear to all parties. So we are getting along very good, but still, we have to, you know, review this process and we have to feel that. Have you ever been in that interview where we both understand that we have to give our best and still we have to do like this interview because human resources demand it so? And I'm like, yeah, well, you know, uh, this year your goal is to be more assertive and more resilient. And then I says, what does it mean? And I'm like, dude, I don't know. I've looked those words in the dictionary and I still don't get it. <laughs> but human resources, you have to be more assertive and resilient. So guess what? I'm going to give you 85% of goal rating. And you're like, 85%? Why? And I'm like, of course, I can't give you 100% because human resources will be mad at me. And I can't give you less than 80% because then you will be mad at me. So how about we call it 85%? We're done. Like, yeah. <laughs> Anyone being there? <laughs> so what the actual fuck are we doing? <laughs> this is crazy. This is nonsense. It makes no sense. So why are we doing this? Why are we conducting the prices? The thing is, are we doing the prices so we increase performance? Are we doing the prices so we increase engagement and motivation? Are we doing these prices because we can determine salaries and compensation and bonuses? Is it about giving feedback to people? Or is it about having a paper trail? You know? Like, I'm going to fire you, but I'm going to have proof that I have been telling you for a long time that you were underperforming. Is this the case? Is this what, why we are investing two million hours a year? Oh God, please tell me it is not the case. And then one question, is it working? Do we have more motivated people, more engaged people? Are we getting good feedback? Do we have better performance? Most of the people in the world are saying, no, it's not working. And when I tell this to companies, and I've done several times, they're like, okay, I get it, but still, I have to do performance reviews. And they're like, no, you don't. It's like with the estimates. I don't want to start an estimate debate, but people are like, yeah, but we need estimates. I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah, but how do you estimate? You don't need to estimate. Yeah, but how do we do the estimates? And they're like, good. And this is the same thing. I don't want to get uh, 
No performance reviews act like hashtag in Twitter started. But the thing is, people are like, yeah, but what do we do instead? Because the real problem remains, which is like, how do we motivate people? How do we engagement? How do we get money salaries, bonuses, compensation, uh, compensation? How do we give feedback? How do we increase performance? Another question I have, what's the case study? Where is the company that is brilliant at doing performance reviews, where everyone is super happy, where they can prove that the performance review process is actually driven, driving the performance increase and the improvement of the company? Where is the case study? I've been looking for it. I would be grateful if somebody pointed me out to the company where I can learn how do you actually do this stuff right. Like, I haven't found it. Everyone is really, really tired of this thing. We can't find a, a, a single clue, a single process that we can copy or something. So why do they fail? I have my own explanation after all these years. I think there's four things that are the, the main causes that the performance review, performance appraisals fail. First of all, performance appraisals, performance reviews, they uh, perpetuate this idea that I am the boss, you are the employee, I am the one that are prepared to evaluate and assess your performance. It's still dad and son, it's fathers and sons. It's like, I know what is better for you, I know that you have to eat your vegetables, and I'm going to review, score, and grade you all. Uh, when you have one person doing that, when you have the boss, uh, making the ratings and the assessment of the people, there's uh, uh, another problem, which is the implicit subjectivity. I have one person that, is all, that always agrees with me. I tend to give better scoring to that person. And then there's another person which always disagrees, there's a pain in the ass, and at the end of the year, I tend to lower his scoring because he's making me feel nervous and anxious and uncomfortable. But maybe what I need is people who disagree with me, so we have innovations, so we have interesting conversations. At the end of the day, when people learn that if you disagree with the boss, that means you are losing money, everyone will agree with me. Yay! I'm happy. Did you solve anything? No. Did you increase your performance? You actually lowered it. You killed innovation. You killed interesting conversations. Because you, we managers, we tend to hire people that are similar to us. That's our main drive. So we have to be very conscious and we should try to hire people that are different, that bring new perspectives. Another reason why um, performance reviews, performance appraisals are failing, well, uh, because the complexity of measuring performance. If we are moving bricks from one, uh, or from one side of the building to another, it's very, very easy to measure performance. How many bricks did you move one ton? How many bricks did you move half a ton? He's twice as productive as this guy. How do you measure productivity for a software developer? Short answer, you can't. How many lines of code did you do? Please, do not measure lines of code as a measure of productivity. That's a very bad idea. Only bad things happen. I guess you understand why. I hope you understand why. Also, maybe we should measure how many features did you make. Okay, I made five features to make one, but my five features are full of bugs and I'm useless, and this one feature cures cancer. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, so it's not about number of features. And if we start with value proposition and value, how do you measure that? It's complex, it's not binary, it's difficult to put a one number in, in, in performance, one metric that would say this person is productive, this person is not productive. I'm tired of te telling managers there's no way you can tell if that person is more productive or that person is less productive by looking at a spreadsheet. But you sit with the team for a month, after that month you will they perfectly know who is the most productive guy in the, in the team, who is the most motivating guy in the team, who has problems and issues, who creates a lot of bugs. You know, because you've been living with them. And your brain is able to process a lot of non-linear, complex information and make guesses. Because at the end of the day, any evaluation, any assessment is a guess. It's like an estimate. Okay? But managers don't want to guess. Managers want a spreadsheet. So they can say, see, I told you, the guy's an asshole. <laughs> now just prove. <laughs> they want the number. So it's not me, it's a spreadsheet. <laughs> Sorry, that's not going to happen. So anyway, also, you have the non-linearities that happens over a year's period. 
Rule, golden rule, please, if you only take one clue out of this talk, let it be this one. Anything you are doing in your company that you are doing yearly, it's evil. Stop it. The yearly employee motivation and engagement poll, evil. Stop it. They ask you once a year, how are you doing? <laughs> you mean today? No, the whole year. The whole year. I can't remember what I had for lunch last Tuesday. <laughs> Now you're asking me how I've been motivated for the whole year and to make like a random, uh, an average? Or what's the point? I don't know. And if you ask me today and we had like salary raises yesterday, yay, I'm super happy. But if yesterday we laid off 50% of the company, now today I'm super uh, demotivated. Whatever the reason, you pinpoint one moment, you, you measure motivation and you're like, oh, people are very demotivated. And then you guess it's because of the lighting system. So you spend the whole year changing the lights. And next year, you again, you ask people how motivated you are. And they are like, we keep demotivated. So you're like, crap, it wasn't the light system. Let's try something else. Two years have passed. <laughs> Anything you've done in a year time, yearly evaluations, yearly calls, yearly salary raises, yearly goals, yearly budgets, that's so outdated. That's so 19th century, come on guys. So anyway, measuring and trying to set goals for a year and trying to... Oh, also you have this lovely situation where you set goals in January and suddenly in March the whole strategy changes. But everyone forgets to change the targets and the, and the performance system so you arrive to December and you're like, oh, this is useless. <laughs> so now again, 85% you have this. <laughs> we are failing, the fear of feedback, all I can tell you a lot about that, we are not trained to receive feedback from others, we, and we don't know how to give feedback to other person in a way that they won't get like mad at us. It's a very difficult process. There's company that have been learning how to do this for years and they are still improving and they are still having issues when some person needs to tell the other person Dude, I think you should do that differently. And that usually triggers a lot of discussion and, 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 and people get, uh, tend to get offended and take it personally. So, and also when you evaluate one person against the others, you are the lowest performing person of your team or you are the best. Hey guys, you should all be like this guy. And then I got <laughs> So, yeah, that's another reason performance reviews are failing. And then you have the, the last but not least, which is the bonuses and the rewards, the zero sum games, and the if you do this, then I will give you that rewards. I mean, the amount of research we have these days against these practices is overwhelming. Still, the companies keep giving people bonuses for performance. You have this quote here, according to Stanford University professors Jeffrey Pfeffer and Robert Sutton, compensation for performance are generally ineffective when tasks are complex or require collaboration. Did you read Drive by Tan Ping? Did you see this RSA animate tech talk by Tan Ping talking about intrinsic motivation and talking about all the findings by Desi and Brian in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, the theory all of self-determination, where they do all these kind of experiments trying to give people rewards and bonuses and incentives in order to have better performance, and they prove once and again and again and again that when the tasks are, uh, when you have rudimentary cognitive skills involved, when you need collaboration, when you have to be naughty, when you need to design, when you need to give good solutions to a problem, giving, giving incentives, offering bonuses, it's worse. So what Pink and many others say is, is you have to get the money out of the table because when people are dealing with money, they don't see nothing else. They only think about money. Anyway, Edward Denning said that. This is my pitiful attempt to draw Sir Edward, <laughs> Sir Edward Denning. Denning, in, in his book, Out of the Crisis, 1986, he said, eliminate numerical quotas, including management by objectives. The full quote starts, management by numerical goal is an attempt to manage without knowledge of what to do. And in fact, it's usually management by fear. 1986, guys, same two years after Nonak and Takeuchi were writing the Scrum paper. There's people that have been telling this stuff to us for 30 years, and still people come out like, okay, yes, I get it, but then, how do I give bonuses to people? <laughs> right. 
I was trying to explain some of my colleagues in one of the coffee breaks that I'm like super disenchanted with this whole industry. This is one of the reasons I'm tired of them saying things over and over and over. It's not, it's not something new. It's not something that we actually have discovered. Okay. So again, okay, what can we do different? We brought it down to four problems. We have to find better ways of uh, collaborating without these ideas of managers, bosses, evaluating the employees, like this idea of the, of the almighty boss that will say, you are a good employee, you are a bad employee, we have to fix that. We have to fix the measurement problem, where you try to put numerical quotas and objectives and goals. We have to solve the feedback and evaluation problem. We have to solve the salary and bonus problem. So my, and for the last seven, eight minutes of the talk, I want to give you some ideas. My advice is that you look at great companies. Because there's a lot of companies right now that are broadcasting the culture and the processes and the way they work and their ideas and their mindset to the whole world. Like for instance, Google, they have this blog, it's called Rework. And they are talking about how to create amazing teams. And they have a lot of information on how they are uh, creating these teams and motivating them and how they hire people and how they train and coach people. There's a lot of information. There's this company, Futurize. Futurize was the best place to work in Europe, number one, for three years in a row. And then they decided not to go for the price anymore because they weren't learning anything. <laughs> they were like, we come to this uh, contest in order to, uh, to the, so we can learn things that we're doing wrong. And if the only thing we get is you're great, you're great, you're great, that's not helping us to improve. So they are not running for the contest anymore. And they have a lot of information on how they are driving the performance thing. And they say, we don't do performance reviews to surprise us. The one most important thing we've done in our company is teach people to ask for feedback. Teach people to constantly ask their colleagues, how am I doing? What can I do differently? I will build on that in a minute. Then you have Netflix. The famous values presentation. They talk a lot about how they hire people, about the culture, about their values. Then you have HubSpot. They also have an, an amazing blog where they are talking about their culture and about how they drive performance and motivation. You have samples. You have a full book, Delivering Happiness, by Tony Shea, but you also have videos and presentations and they are talking about all their experiments. The ones that, that go right and the ones that are more controversial, like the whole holacracy thing. But they're trying, and they're doing experiments, and they're learning. What works, what doesn't work. That's amazing, that's brilliant. Um, you have Buffer. Buffer is another company which has an amazing culture and they are doing a lot of effort in broadcasting that culture. You have Happy Money. I'm part of the Happy Money Network, European Apollo. Delivering happy, I mean, Managing for Happiness, this is, this is the new book. And we are talking about what we learn in a lot of companies we are coaching and we are, we are learning how to do these things differently. And then there's companies I've been coaching myself, like things, so for instance, InfoJobs. It's a Spanish company and we, in 2012, we won the best place to work in Spain for medium 200 to 500 uh, people size. And we are really, really proud of that. The alma mater of this project, which was the product manager, CEO of the company, Gabriel Pratt, he moved on and he created his whole company, it's called Hoshin Plan. And from Hoshin Plan, he's also broadcasting a lot of the things he's doing to make great cultures and to help companies have great cultures. And for instance, one of the companies he's helping, Upstream, they're also sharing their peer review process, which is far better than anything that I've seen at big companies and traditional companies. And then I also have the, my dear friends at Happy Force. Happy Force was a company where that I was coaching for several years into we started with Swam, Agile, and then we moved past that into culture and motivation and great teams. And we won the best place to work in Spain for two years in a row. Okay, so and the, now they have this app, Happy Force. It is an application to measure the motivation of the people and to maintain a continuous dialogue with the whole workforce on a daily basis instead of yearly. Okay? So what are they doing different? These great companies like Google, like Netflix, Sappos, uh, Futurize, InfoJobs, Happy Forth, several good examples of people that are creating amazing cultures and are attracting a lot of talent and they are keeping the talent even when they are not able to match the salaries in the market, people are refusing to leave these companies because they are great. So it's like an amazing thing. I'm really, really proud 
of having part of, of this kind of situation, of this kind of culture and environment. So what they are doing differently, and I will start with the last part of the talk, is number one, conversation pro uh, the compensation problem. What they're doing is looking at the science and saying paying people for performance doesn't work on complex design idea collaboration environments. Stop doing that. How do we set salaries? Well, it's a complex uh, answer, uh, question. There are several answers. Netflix, for instance, they say we pay top of the market. You're not going to earn more money than. Oops. What was that? Hello? I think that. Ah, here it is. I'm being sabotaged by the status quo. I don't want you to learn this. So. <laughs> no, 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 stop telling them that. <laughs> no, 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 no. So anyway. Metal space top of the market. They say, we are not going to earn more than here doing what we do right now. You're happy? Okay, now you have to be 10 times more productive than the average. If you're a front-end Java developer, you are going to pay, be paid top of the market in Netflix. But you have to be 10 times better than the average front-end Java developer. That's what they ask for. And it's a good deal. Or for instance, Semco, where they say, we share information with the people. We show them uh, how much other companies are paying for this role. We show them how much money the company has right now. We show them how everyone in the company is earning. And then we let them decide what are the salary plans. That's a very advanced culture. Uh, in management 3.0, oh, you hang up a happy minute, you talk about salary formula. And I like that idea. The idea of salary formula is telling people how salaries are determined. Because according to my experience, there's two things that are the ones that, uh, there's three things that are the ones that most will influence your salary. Number one is how much you earn in your previous job. Nothing you can do right now to change that. Number two is uh, how hard you negotiated in the interview uh, process. You can't change that right now. And number three is how long you've been with us. You can change that. So it's like pretty unfair because suddenly I realized that all is making way more money than me doing the same job. And maybe even I consider myself to be more productive than Noah. And then I ask, why is he being paid more? And he said, oh, he was being paid more in his previous job. I cannot do anything about that. He was a tough negotiator. I cannot do anything. And he's been here for three or four years more than you. Dude, that's no reason. So the solution of the company for these kind of situations is it's forbidden to talk about salaries. Do not tell anyone what's your salary. And you're like, really? <laughs> Come on, you gotta be kidding me. Everyone knows how every, each, each, each of your company or colleagues is earning. And then I've even been in a situation where human resources were like, well, you shouldn't. <laughs> ah, okay, problem solved. <laughs> So get rid of the bonus system, get rid of the incentive system, that doesn't work. Pay people fairly, be transparent about how everyone works. And if someone says, I want to earn more money, show them the way. Okay, you cannot earn more money being a receptionist, but maybe you want to push your career on sales. And then I can help you with that. Is something that you want to work on? Okay, yes, no. No, I prefer to keep doing my salary, but I don't like to be in sales, or I don't want to be a master, or, or if you are a developer and you want to earn more money, I can show you how to earn more money by running into more responsibility, mentoring other people, I don't know. Be clear and transparent about these kind of things. Then about uh, the command and control, bosses, and, and, you know, the fear of evaluation, make it collaborative. Like, for instance, you should study the objectives and key results process at Google, Intel, and many other comp uh, companies. It's a complex process, it has many parts, but one of the things I like the most is that these goals that the company set on an individual team and a company level, most of them are emerging. Like, I will go to my manager and I will say, this year, I want to become the most knowledgeable person in the company when it comes to DevOps. And he will say, I can, I can see how that relates to our performance. Okay, let's work on that. I will be the one proposing my goals, and that's amazing. And then at the end of the year, these goals, these objective and key results, are improvement driven. It's not about, oh, you didn't make it. If you make 90%, 60%, 50%, that's okay, we've improved. You make less than 40% of the goal, that means it was too difficult, too ambitious. Maybe we should try for something smaller. You make more than 90%, it was too easy. Maybe we should try for something more harder. And so, 
making it collaborative and having everyone participating in the process brings down that fear of evaluation. Like for instance, in Happy Force, they are doing employee company retrospectives, where we will gather together, we will have someone from, uh, they, they have achieved the happiness officer, they will have human resources, of course, but they will have someone from the happiness department, some technical manager, some business manager, and the employees, and we will do a retrospective about both sides. What do you see that managers are doing great? What do you see that managers need to improve? And we work on that, and we say the same about employees. So it's a two-side process, it's not about me evaluating you. Okay. Then you have the measurement problem. I will, I have to finish that over time, but what I use here is, is, is a, uh, uh, what I call the marriage counseling metaphor. I mean, you're not doing this with your wife, right? Oh, honey, it's our wedding anniversary, so it's time to perform a review. <laughs> See our goals. Uh, sex. Hmm. It's to improve. I told you last year. I'm going to give you six out of ten here. Don't try this at home. <laughs> but if you don't do that to your spouse, don't do that to your employees. Don't do that to your colleagues. It's not fair. It's not a good thing. Okay? It's not fair rating people. Okay, and, and putting numbers into people conduct and behavior and how do you feel about people. Instead of that, try to think on the whole process of ca as counseling, as therapy, okay? And the last one, when I'm finishing, is the feedback problem. So you have to eliminate the fear of feedback. My guideline would be, first you have to teach people how to give good feedback. Even in that case, some people will give crappy and shitty feedback. So you have to teach people to receive bad feedback and say, okay, you are pissed off, but I can get something positive out of it. And then you have to ask people to, uh, you have to learn, teach people how to ask for feedback. So the feedback process is constant. It's not something you do once a year, okay? This will be my, my final summary, focus on improvement. Do not mix improvement and feedback and collaboration with compensation and salaries. It's a different thing. It doesn't work. Teach people to give, receive, and ask for feedback. Set goals together. Bring everyone into the conversation. Be open and transparent. And make the process continuous. This is something that should work on a small scale every two weeks, on a bigger scale every month, and an importance review should be happening every three months or so. So it's constant. It's not something you do once a year. My good friend, Luis Gonzalez from Microsoft, is writing a book on performance review. Keep an eye on it. And remember, all this is not extra work, it's your actual job. Thank you so much.